welcome friends to this great event on the hill this is we call the hill because we are higher than the level ground and i hope we will keep on rising higher not necessarily outside but inside you will come across many hills in your meditational practices inside the beautiful mountains and hills which you come across when you go into a spiritual journey and these beauties outside also look more beautiful once you have seen the beauty inside i was once standing in a garden with the great master and i mentioned to him master look at these beautiful mountains and trees how pretty they look he said yes but the inner ones are even more beautiful i said master then why are you looking at these if you have already seen the more beautiful ones inside he said when you see the more beautiful one inside these look even more beautiful and in a talk he gave later in the evening he gave a little story and i am going to tell you that story once upon a time that's how story is begin you know <laughs> once upon a time there was a great king in china who wanted to see if the artists of china or japan were better artists at painting on the walls it was common practice in those days to have big paintings done on the walls of the palaces and temples and so on so he set apart a large hall and made wall, one wall on one side as the china wall and made the opposite wall as the japanese wall and he put a curtain in the middle so they could not copy each other so all the chinese artists came and began to work on the chinese wall they brought very beautiful colors they brought their best talent to paint and they painted a beautiful mosaic beautiful type of uh, shining lovely painting on their wall while this was going on and the king had given them 14 days to complete the task days were passing by and the japanese were only polishing their wall they were doing nothing else the king was surprised he said aren't you going to start painting he said we will wait 14th day came they were still polishing the wall and the chinese had already completed their work the king is came and saw the chinese work he says beautiful remarkable wonderful he went to the japanese side what about your work he said remove the curtain as they remove the curtain the reflection of the chinese wall came right upon their looked even more beautiful than the chinese one the japanese one by creating a reflection because the reflection had a depth in it which the original wall did not have what we have on the astral plane as beauty gets reflected in a big way over here there is something here which we don't have there and what is that the ability to use free will even to appreciate beauty when we are there beauty is there we are there but when we are here the same beauty reflected on the physical plane enables us to appreciate that beauty out of our free will and that's why even this is more beautiful but once you have seen the original if there is no original and you think this is the original it's not as beautiful as when you have seen the original and then seen its reflection in the physical plane so i'm very happy that we are here in the midst of beautiful trees on top of a hill the site of the future conference center phase 1 of the conference center which will become a dera that i will designate and name it after my master the great master azur maharaj baba sawan singh i am so happy to see all of you here i am so happy that you are joining me in doing this seva for the tribute i want to pay to my master i should emphasize that the buildings we have outside are not to be taken as the building where we will get any any high spiritual experience the buildings outside do not give you enlightenment the building that will give you enlightenment is the one we are carrying with us all the time our human body this is the building in which we get enlightened the building we are going to make here in phase 1 the dome that's coming up here and phase 2 the main building across the street from here these are for logistical purposes 
so that when we meet again, we may not have to sit all on, this, on the grass. We may not have to gather together there for having a picture. We may be able to sit in an auditorium and a place where we can comfortably sit, even if it rain, shower or sun. So it's for logistical purposes. And yet, it becomes a symbol. It becomes an important symbol. This place, which we are now in the process of building up, is going to be the housing for meditation and for spiritual discourses by several masters to come. This has already been predicted, arranged by my master, great master, Azur Maharaj Baba Savan Singh, that this is not something that I am building for my sake at all. How could I be planning such things at my age? I'm already going to be 89 in a couple of months. I am doing this for that for the sake of the shift of the spiritual axis of spirituality, for the spirituality that has been there on the east side of the globe, which is going to come to the west side. And this is the place which will be a big center. All these years I have been watching the westerners, seekers, trying to find truth and enlightenment, running to the east to look for enlightenment. A time is coming very soon when the easterners will be looking for true enlightenment, finding perfect living masters and will run to the west in the same way and discover the masters right here. This shift is a very big shift taking place in such a way as to give a proper turn to the west, which has seen something else that the east did not see. The east saw spirituality, saw religion, saw wisdom of a certain kind. But they did not see the technology and affluence that the West saw in the last couple of centuries. Now it's going to be the reverse. That we will not be caring so much for the wealth and affluence, material wealth so much here in the West, but more for spiritual values. East will be running after the wealth now. They'll be building more factories, building more industries. Think that's the aim of of man to make more money. Here that aim has ended. Money has not given the joy and bliss that they were expecting. Money has not given happiness to them. I have several friends who are multimillionaires. They are in, in the business of movies. They are business of big industries. Business of great enterprises they are doing. All of them are so sad. I cannot find that sadness in the poor people working in a field in India. That is why money has not solved the problem of happiness or unhappiness. It may have solved other problems of physical comfort, just making yourself physically more comfortable, mentally more uncomfortable. The physical comfort is not what we all want. We want spiritual comfort. We want enlightenment. We want to know who we are. We want to find the truth. We are all looking for the truth. And this is a great center where such people will come who will be able to share the ultimate truth with us. And that is why I am so pleased to come here today once again to the site of the future conference center, which I will name the Dera after my own beloved master, Baba Sahavan Singh, once this dome is ready. And I am very happy that you all decided to help me in this task. If you had not helped, I would still have struggled to work with my own bare hands to put one sword after another to make a little hut if possible. I would have made a little mound with a little cave out here and I would have called it the Dera of my master. But you have all helped me to make it a slightly better design. Not slightly, I think a much better design. <laughs> when I see these Australian artists, these Australian architects like Karun and his wife Sonika draw up these drawings, I feel very pleased. They're living on the other side of the world. They're living in the down under place. And these designs that you see have been sent from there. And people are working around the globe for this center. So that is why it's going to be a great place. And I'm very happy that you all come to help me with this. And we will be having a great time. I will be very happy when this is ready and come and dedicated to my master at that time. So I am th thankful to all of you. Express my gratitude on my own behalf and on behalf of my master, great master Hazur Maharaj Baba Sahavan Singh, whose spirit is right here at this moment, watching the fulfillment of his prediction, the fulfillment of his prophecy, 
that the excess of spirituality will move from the east to the west and localize in a big way in the United States of America. That's where we are sitting right now. People from around the globe will flock to this place one day. And this will be one of the greatest centers of enlightenment and spiritual upliftment of mankind. So I am so glad for you to join me. Thank you very much. And I give you my master's blessings and my full love for all the endeavors you are putting in. Thank you. I saw two people meditating in a cosmos. One of them is saying, it is so difficult. The two people, sit. one is a younger person, one older person. The older person is saying, it is so difficult to keep on thinking of the same thing that they want us to think. And I can't keep it, my mind on that. Some words I want to repeat, but I can't keep my mind on it. And every time I try to keep on rem remembering those words, my mind goes out. So the person says, easy, dinner, 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 dinner. <laughs> That's a food joke. <laughs> I want to tell you, why, why are we having vegetarian food? People have asked me during this, during some interviews and personal times also this question, that when we are talking of such high stuff, going to our true home, going out of the physical world itself and discovering something true, what has a small little item, like what we eat, got to do with a spiritual enlightenment? Food should be the least important thing. Meditation, giving time to these things, study of spirituality should have high priority. And why are we thinking it's so important that we should be vegetarian, we should not eat meat, not drink alcohol? Some people say drinking alcohol helps me in meditation. <laughs> My, my soul goes somewhere. <laughs> I don't know where it goes. <laughs> what is wrong with it? The truth is that this instruction masters have given from time to time that eat vegetarian food and avoid drugs and alcohol is based upon two principles. The first principle is a very simple physical principle, and that is that the food we eat, which is an essential thing for us to survive, is a survival. You can't survive without food. The food we eat affects us. Not only what we eat, how much we eat, affects us in one very significant way which we don't realize, and that is the power to concentrate our attention. If you have a heavy meal, you cannot have the same power of concentration as you can have with a light meal. When we eat any kind of food, whether they are vegetables or they are birds or they are animals or human beings, whatever we eat affects our power of concentration. And how does it affect? Because our subconscious mind is constantly aware of what has happened which brought the food to us even when we are not conscious of it. You have killed an animal, you didn't kill it, so the law of karma, they say, is the person who killed the animal is responsible for it. I only eat what is dead already. Well, if you are eating a dead animal, even then, the subconscious knows what you are eating. And it affects your power of concentration, even though you have not killed the animal. This, is, this has been examined over and over again. Whether the subconscious does work like that, it does. Now, you can test it out. Supposing you have a book to read and you read at one time one page in one minute, then you go and kill an animal and come and read it. Or even eat a dead food and read it. Time will be more than one minute. It's automatic. Automatically, the kind of life that we extinguish in order to concentrate our attention changes. If we extinguish the life at the lowest level, which are vegetables, they are also got, they have also got the same souls. They are living things. We are not saying that we are not eating living things. Nobody lives on stones and rock and, and dirt. We all extinguish life no matter what, even vegetarians. But when we extinguish life at the lowest level of 
their awareness, it affects us in the lowest way in our power of concentrating our attention. The moment you raise it to other levels, the impact on our power of concentrating varies accordingly. If you were to kill a bird and come back and your power of concentration is affected, it takes quite a while to get it back. If you kill a bigger animal, even more. If you kill, an 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 kill a man, kill a human being, it will be even more. So what is happening is that our power to concentrate our attention is affected depending upon what food we eat, also how much we eat. That is why if you want to be successful in high quality meditation, it's a very useful thing to avoid those kinds of foods where your power of concentration is diminished and you cannot use the best use of your meditation. So that is why that's one big reason to why these mystics and saints have recommended that if you want to meditate, then eat the food that extinguishes life of the lowest order or that has been food that has been killed by somebody whose effect you are feeling in your subconscious of the lowest order. That's one big reason for those who are serious meditators. For those who do not want to meditate, it doesn't matter what you eat. Because since I expect that all my friends who come to me are serious in their trying to meditate and discover the truth, I do recommend to them that please take vegetarian food. It will be useful. You will be able to find out whether I am telling you is the truth or not by following a simple direction. But it does not mean that be a glutton and fill up your vegetarian food and say I can now do better meditation. Too much food. Food that is not the best for you, not the healthiest for you, also affects you. So therefore, if you can pick up the right food, in ancient days, they used to divide food into certain categories which the Vedic literature has described as Sattvic food and Rajas food, Rajvik food and Tamsik food. They, they divided the food that to make it the best food that which was Sattvic which was best for meditation. So, the principle underlying was the same. Eat the food with the least extinguishing of life and eat it lightly. Especially don't eat too much at night if your meditation timings is before going to bed in early morning. If you want to have a larger meal, because you can't be too hungry and meditate also, but if you want a larger meal, make it the morning breakfast or lunch as the more important meal rather than your dinner or the late night supper or whatever you take at that time. So this is the reason, but there is a more important reason than that. There is only one physical reason, there is a spiritual reason. Spiritual reason is we say we are seekers of the truth. It's the highest thing that we are looking for. The world means nothing to us. And then you come up to a master and say, the world means nothing, I have come to seek. But you know, I can't give up meat. <laughs> Does it make sense? Is that your priority? If the priority is that meat is more important than spirituality, go on eating meat. Forget the spirituality for now. If you want to follow the spiritual path, lay down the correct priority. If your priority is that you can't give up meat and alcohol for something so valuable, which you recognize, then you are not giving it the priority that's needed to be a true seeker. You're not seeking that. You're just curious about it. And curiosity can kill the cat. <laughs> you know, heard all that. Simple curiosity, by not following it, with divided attention to your food, is told you have not to eat, you eat, it's divided, there's guilt in your head, how would you meditate? These are all not conducive to meditation. And that is why the more important reason is, do you think that as a seeker, your seeking is more important. And therefore, a master has just put a little a test before you. What do you prefer? Do you want to prefer eating meat and drinking alcohol? Do you want the spiritual? It does not mean the spiritual truth can ever be equated. It's something that no amount of vegetarianism can give you. Vegetarianism itself is not spirituality. I once went to Japan and met a Zen group that was teaching us that the truth 
and of enlightenment lies in a grain of rice. Of course, it has to be a special grain grown in Japan. And I said, I'd like to try that which one little grain of rice can give me enlightenment. I just put it in my mouth, I'll go to Sachkan. <laughs> they said, it's very expensive. <laughs> they were making good money out of it. <laughs> I found the special rice was no more than ordinary rice. <laughs> but it carried with it a psychological drama attached to it that with this rice you get enlightenment and just take a little bit. And I asked them, how can a grain of rice contain, how can it contain this whole spirituality and whole enlightenment? They said, this rice, seed of this rice came from the same place in Patniputra and in that place where Buddha walked and this rice was grown on that soil and we brought that soil with us and we grow this rice on that soil. It has Buddha into it. Therefore, Buddha as you know is not the name of a person. The guy we called Buddha today, his name was Siddharth, Gautam Siddharth. And why did we call him Buddha? Because he got buddhi, he got wisdom, he got enlightenment. That's why we call him Gautam Siddha, the Buddha. Gautam said, there are several Buddhas and several Buddhas will come. And those who were being trained by him, they were not called disciples because bodhisattvas, those becoming Buddhas. So Buddha is not something that the person who was there who soiled was there and we bring the soil and eat the rice. How can that be? But superstition is a very strong thing. He can follow any superstition. These perfect living masters come here to take our superstitions away from us, not to create more superstitions. They want us to leave the superstitions behind, go to reality and find out. And that is why this kind of talk that this particular food will give this is not the food. It's what effect it has on you what you are going to get out of it. And that is why the food itself just becomes a, a means of a master checking out your priority. Talking of priority, we do not give priority to the spiritual path itself in our life. We say we have so many responsibilities. I have to go to my job, I have to take care of the children, take care of my spouse, take care of my family, take care of my friends. I take care of my house, take care of my car, I take care of my vehicle, take care of this. We are constantly taking care of things. Therefore, when we have time, we can meditate also. And these things are all important. And only when we have done all these things, when we find time, we'll give it to spirituality and to meditation. That's a very low priority. That means you think these things which are only existing while you are in the body for a short time very short time is more important than what you can get for eternity. That we never understood what spirituality is. It's something forever. Whereas these things you are doing, these responsibilities are only for the short time you are in a human body in that position, in that karmic position of being married in a certain place, born in a certain place, related to people in a certain place, having jobs in a certain place, all karmic events to settle your karma. And you're doing all that automatically in the midst of all this to make those as a priority and say an enlightenment will come when I have a little time out of these is putting it is a very low priority. When you put a low priority, it remains a low priority at the end of the I never got anything from my Namdan, from my initiation, from my spiritual guru, I got nothing out of it. Well, you never gave it any importance. The thing that was unimportant, temporarily you gave more importance to those. Whereas you ought to have given more importance to this. But people can question, are you suggesting that we should give up our responsibilities? We should abandon our families? We should resign from our jobs? Not at all. I am saying do these things as if that were also meditation. Take care of your family as if you are doing it as under instruction from your master, it becomes like meditation. Do your job, whatever job you are doing, keeping this in mind while you are doing your job, that you are doing it for your master, it becomes meditation. What is meditation? 
Meditation is merely a means to remember your master and develop love and devotion. And that can happen with whatever you are doing. You do not have to abandon any responsibility at all. But carry out all your responsibilities with that feeling in your head, the thought in your head. This is master. One day you will also begin to think, I am not even doing it. As if master is doing it. And that's the easiest way to fulfill these responsibilities. You never have to shirk these responsibilities. They are part of the spiritual growth if you hand them over to your master and think master is doing them. Later on you know he is doing it. In the beginning you might think I am doing it. But later it becomes he is doing it. That's actual experience. It grows on you. And you can, and you can feel it. But in addition to that, I still say, no matter what your condition is, no matter what your responsibilities are, no matter what jobs you are doing, no matter what your family situation is, you still have a private time early morning when you wake up. If you can't give an hour, two hours to this meditation, you can give five minutes. Nobody can say, I didn't even have five minutes. And if somebody can really prove to me, I didn't even have five minutes early morning to do meditation, I'll say do one minute. And it will be equally effective. It's not the time. It's not how much you meditate. It depends on the quality of meditation. I was emphasizing this point even during this meditation workshop. That meditation done with love and devotion. Even for a minute. Even for five minutes. Carries more value. Than meditating all day but thinking of other things. So that is why. Use at least some time when you wake up. And some time when you go to sleep. That's a good tip I'm telling you from practice that when you do that early morning when you wake up and at night before you go to bed, nobody is going to stop you. Not even a nagging wife can do that. <laughs> they think you're sleeping. Sometimes they might say, why are you sleeping upright? <laughs> I went to Norway and saw that there used to be a kind of people living called Vikings. The Vikings lived in Norway on the coast and I went and saw their old homes which are still preserved and I saw the beds in which they were very tall people. The Vikings were very tall people but the beds were small four feet squares with a railing on all four sides and I asked them how can a tall six foot seven foot man sleep in this bed? He said, they all slept upright sitting. They all sat and slept. I said, oh, I understand. I, I don't know people in my part of the world sleeping like that, they sleep like this. But when we are doing meditation, we do sleep like that. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that if we can do this short meditation, without a disturbance, early morning, and that short meditation before going to sleep. What is the effect of it? The effect is night-long meditation. That's what happens. You can try it. That if you can concentrate on high-quality meditation for five minutes when you wake up, and five minutes when you go to sleep, you are meditating all night long. If you make it a continuous habit, you'll find your progress in five minutes will be more that you progress in two and a half hours of meditation. So that is why some people have said, what is this guy recommending? We were told by our masters that it is necessary to do two and a half hours. We heard one of the YouTube talks, he is saying five minutes is enough. I am not stopping people from doing two and a half hours. I want to make it clear that I am not stopping anybody from meditating all day if they have the time in their own karmic setup. If they have time, yes, spend as much time as you can. I have myself tried from one minute to eight hours. I have tried. It is not the time that matters. It what matters is the quality of the meditation. It's not the time, not the hours. And I gave an example the other day of a man who insisted on two and a half hours meditation. He invited me to join him and I sat with him while he had put the alarm to wake up at three, to have a second alarm at 5.30 to finish meditation. We could neither begin earlier nor end later. So we were tied up, imprisoned for two and a half hours into meditation. <laughs> the prison of meditation for two and a half hours. 
I along with my friend. I have never liked too much imprisonment. <laughs> I never liked being prostrated like this, whether in space or in time. There I was prostrated. So I couldn't meditate. I was I was attending to the barriers of my prison, the sides of the prison. 3 a.m., 5.30 a.m. There were the barriers. I was trapped in the middle. But since I couldn't meditate, all I could do was to continuously, from time to time, not continuously, from time to time, open my eyes to see what he was doing. <laughs> and he was doing something remarkable. Every few minutes, every time I looked, he was looking at his watch. It is so hard to pass two and a half hours like that. I know it. If your mind is not in meditation, if your mind is not experiencing the love and devotion for a master, if your mind is not communicating with the master, if your mind is not hugging your master, if your mind is not with the master, two and a half hours is a very long time to go through. And we can't meditate for that long. But if you are there, eight hours will pass, you won't even think there are 15 minutes. It's such a big difference. Such a big difference when you enjoy your meditation and when you think it's a chore which has to be done. That is why we don't go by an artificial rule that's imposed upon us. We are not artificial people. We are natural people. So we go naturally into this thing. Surt Shabda Yoga, which I recommend, is a natural process. There is nothing artificial in it. It's a natural process of awakening and finding out who you are. So remain natural and give the natural time that is needed. But the essential element, never forget. It is the love and devotion that makes meditation good. It's love and devotion that takes you beyond the mind. It's love and devotion that will take you to your true home, such country. I hope the food has arrived now. Yeah. <laughs>